Uh, this is Stephen Sloan. The date is March 6, 2013. I'm with Mr. Uh, William Bill Danner. Uh, his uh, apartment, or in his apartment complex, the Monte Vista Apartments at 1575 Belvedere in El Paso, Texas. This is an interview for the Texas Liberators of World War II Concentration Camps Oral History Project. Thank you, Mr. Danner, for sitting down with me today. Uh, I'd like to start with some of your earliest memories and a little bit about your, I know you were born in Elwood, Indiana, uh, but some of your early memories of life there in Indiana. Well, one of the first things I can ba basically remember was my granddad. I could remember seeing this white-haired old gentleman sitting back in his wicker rocker and I would come in and he would call me South Pole or Tar Heel. And that was my granddad and, I, but, and he passed away in 1928 so he must have, I must have been about five years old at the time. I was born and raised in, and uh, within that area in central Indiana. We lived on farms at some time and lived in the city. I graduated from Elwood High School in 1941. Uh, Elwood was the home of Wendell Wilkie and he caused me and a couple of others to get kicked out of history class a couple of times because the, the teacher we had lived in Wilkie's home and he was a hot Democrat and we was always razzing him about it. <laughs> uh, I started college in the fall of 42, Franklin College at Franklin, Indiana and was drafted in February of 43. While I was at Franklin College at, uh, the first time, I was pledged and joined the Sigma Alpha Epsilon fraternity and, it, and have been a member for many years. In December of 43, I was initiated. I was in a military uniform. I was on leave from Louisiana State University. The Army had an uh, specialized, Army specialized training program. They were going to teach us to be graduate engineers in 18 months. Mm -hmm. And I was there when the, the uh, invasion took place and they sent us all back to the Army. Mm -hmm. I took my basic training at Camp Swift, Texas in the artillery as a forward observer for the uh, for uh, former uh, for the former uh, yeah excuse the uh, I can't think now what the the forward artillery forward artillery observer yeah. yes. I was a radio operator for forward artillery mm -hmm. after the ASTP I was sent back to the Army engineers and I went to the anti tank company four hundred fourteenth infantry regiment of the uh, 104th Infantry Division. Well, um, I, I, I'd like to go back a little bit if I could and ask yeah. you a couple of questions. Um, so you said uh, you grew up on the farm. Was your father a farmer primarily? He, my father worked several things. He was a hired hand. and uh, But uh, we had a great life on a farm. And it was, and I learned to learn to be a farmer. And I thought when I graduated from high school that that's what I would be, because I, I in high school I majored in vocational agriculture. I took all the agriculture courses, but sometime in my senior year I decided that was not it. That I wanted to go to college. I did not have the right credit enough of the right credits to go to college, so I went to the school board and asked him if I could go back to high school for another year and take the courses I needed to get into college and they agreed and I went back to high school for the fifth year. Mm -hmm. A lot of work on the farm growing up. I, I learned a lot of work on yeah. the farm. Yeah. The, fa the fellow that my dad worked for, he put me to work too and I can remember he gave me a check one time this was back during a depression for a check for five dollars and down in the corner where it says four he put piddling. <laughs> but just odd jobs on the farm that I could do, I did. You know what you spent your five dollars on? I don't remember and I met his son years later 
and I said something about this and he says I have all of dad's checks he says I'll see if I can find it if I can find it I will send it to you but I never got it <laughs> I would love to, would like to have had it <laughs> so your family did all right during the depression well we lived yeah we uh, I taught school I would talk about the depression the, uh, the, and I told them that we went, that my dad was offered a job on a farm for five dollars a week and they says, how did you live? And I says, we lived great. Well, how did you do that? I can't live on five dollars a day. I says, everything come off the farm, the only thing we had to buy was salt and pepper and sugar and flour. And that was it. Yeah. What, what sort of farming what, was he involved with? Was it wheat? Or just general farm. Okay. We had wheat, we yeah. had bread and corn. Uh -huh. uh, he kept feeder cattle in the winter time. The the fellow that my dad worked for had feeder cattle in the winter time. And just general farm work. Well, when you, when you were young, what were your chores around the farm? Well, I drove a tractor. I learned to drive a tractor. I could plow a field. I could. Uh, plow corn, uh, uh, cultivate the corn, and just take care of the animal. I learned how to milk. The fact is, I come in high school one night uh, late, and my dad got me up at four o'clock in the morning, and it was cold, and we went and milked the cows. <laughs> <laughs> it left an impression on you. <laughs> did, did. <laughs> Don't stay out late. <laughs> did you have uh, siblings? I have a, had a sister. Uh -huh. In fact, is I had two sisters. One of them was born a year and a day after I was, and she died on her second birthday. And my other sister passed away in 1970. Okay. Um, now, you, you said you didn't have enough credits to get into college immediately. Had you taken time off school? No, uh, I had. Uh, most of my courses were agriculture courses. And what I needed was some more math and science courses. Mm -hmm. I went back to school, I took advanced algebra, plain and solid geometry, trigonometry, chemistry, and physics. I see. In one year. Did you enjoy school? I enjoyed school. I, uh, one time, we were on the farm, I did not. I, I failed the fifth grade. I had to go back and take another year there, but uh, other than that, uh, I had I had a good time in school. And I was involved. And what did you do for fun? I think at that time, when I was in high school, we we did our own things. There was a group of us that I was with run with. There were four of us, four boys and four girls we dated, and we would not not steady dates. We would go out and one of us would be with one of the girls, the next time we would be with one of the others. And we just enjoyed ourselves and and I know I I taught school for ten years after I retired. And somebody would say they're having a party, and the first thing they want to know, how many kegs you gonna have? And the kids would ask me, well, did you drink when you were in high school? I says, no. I don't know of anybody that did. If they did, they kept it a secret. And they wanted, did you have a car? No. The only one that had a car was a, a son of one of the uh, morticians in town, and he had a Model T Ford. <laughs> <laughs> but which wasn't sporty by any means. Yet. No, <laughs> we. I tried to play football, but I wasn't. I wasn't an athletic type, and but uh, it, it, we had we we had fun, clean fun, as I think, because we could go out in, in the evening and and enjoy ourselves. And uh, the night after after we graduated, I had been doing part-time work for one of the undertakers that there was his office right next to the school. And I asked him if I could use one of the limos after graduation. 
We went to the neighboring town. We saw a movie, uh, Alexander's Ragtime Band. We went to the movie. We went back home. There were four couples, and each we went to each home and had part of breakfast. This was all set up beforehand with our parents, and that's what we, that's what we did for graduation fun. Mm -hmm. And nobody drank. It was just a, a good time. Yeah, that's great. And well, um, take me through this transition to college. So you you had a desire to go to college. You went back and took your extra courses. Did you know where you wanted to go? I knew at the time. I was raised as a Baptist and Franklin College is a Baptist school and that's where I wanted to go to school and I was accepted and I started there in the fall of 1942 and I did not get a semester completed before I was drafted. I dropped out of school, was drafted, went into the Army and when I got out of the Army I went back to Franklin in January of 46. Now, were you following the war much, or did, did you have connections to the war before you were drafted? Do you have no. Did you have family that were... Uh, I had an uncle, one of my mother's brothers, was a member of the Indiana National Guard, and that's about the only... I know that, that he was always going off to summer camp before that and the like, but other than that, uh, no real connection with the military. But, uh, All right, so you get your draft notice. Do you remember your reaction? Well, not not really. I knew that I would be drafted. I would get a draft because we all had to register. I knew what, uh, that I would would be called. And uh, of course, it was 1943 before I was drafted. Mm -hmm. I left Indiana or was drafted at Fort Benjamin Harrison inducted at Fort Benjamin Harrison in Indianapolis. We left there on the, ironically, on the fifth day of March of 1943. It was five degrees below zero. We had on our wool uniforms, our wool underwear, the whole works. Three days later, we landed at Camp Swift, Texas. It was 85 degrees. And there we were, still in law, winter clothes. Now, is uh, when did you take your exams for placement into the ASTP? We, well, when we went in, we were given intelligence type exams. We were going through all kinds, and I think that's where they got the information, because I was never called to take a, a test to get into this. I was given orders to go, mm -hmm. and uh, everybody. A lot of the people that went into ASTP were out of the Air Force, uh, Army Air Force at the time, and they had a lot of more sergeants and the like, but everybody was reduced to a PFC. Mm -hmm. And we, I went to Louisiana State University, and we lived in the uh, rooms underneath the, sta the stadium, and but when the, the invasion happened, we were all sent back to the Army. Mm -hmm. So you were taking, for a brief period there, engineering classes? Yes, right? regular college courses. Regular college courses. And uh, I saw something the other night that talked about the advancement. When we were going there, all the engineers had a big scabbard on the hook to their belt with a slide rule in it. And we were taught in math classes, we were taught to use a slide rule. And it just seemed that this, the other day on something on TV, they were wanting the, the square root of something. And the guy had the slide rule in the gallery with a, with a little calculator, and that quick she had it and he was still sliding back and <laughs> But it, it's just the, advancement that I've seen over the time has been to me fascinating. Oh yeah, well that, we're going to talk about where you ended up your career and boy you saw a lot of technological changes 
right. in the period you were in the military. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so ASTP is canceled, and so they transfer you out of LSU. I went to the, was uh, assigned to the 104th Infantry Division. They had just finished their maneuvers from Campadere, Oregon, down to Yuma, Arizona. We met in some place in the desert outside of Yuma, and uh, we were there just a short period of time. We were in a tent camp out there. We loaded on board trains, and we went to Fort Carson, Colorado, where we finished our uh, training, uh, smoothed out the rough spots, and in August of 1944, we left uh, Fort Carson for Europe. So now what sort of training were you doing at Fort Carson? I was with the Regimental Anti-Tank Company. We had 57, 57 millimeter anti-tank guns, and our crew was thoroughly trained. Everybody within the, gun, within the squad was trained for every position on that gun. Mm -hmm. And I guess we were lucky when we got to Europe we were lucky enough to never encounter a tiger tank. <laughs> but so there in Colorado, you were doing target practice. And, we were and just gun drill. Yeah. Uh, what they were, was referred to as cannoneers hop. <laughs> we it's a lot of times we would just be in the company area, or if we were out in the maneuver areas, we'd be driving down the uh, road in a convoy and all at once somebody would holler action and we off the truck, get the truck, the gun ready, set it up to where, where it was be, to be, and that was it. And it was, a lot of times it was fun, sometimes it get kind of boring. Mm -hmm. Our gun had a trails on it that had to be open and one time, that the, the, one of the jobs that I was doing at that time, I was supposed to step between the trails when they opened them, and I was faster than they were, and I stepped across them when they opened them. <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. But it, no problem. We just want to, everybody get a, got a big kick out of it. Uh, more than you did, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm interested to ask, we were to a period now where you've been in the, how are you taking the Army life at this time? Well, to me, it was something that had to be done. And I think that was the, the, the thing with most of us at that time. Uh, I cannot, well, I don't remember any big uh, riots or what have you, whatever you want to call them, after the service, everybody went back to what they were doing. And I don't remember people having, uh, what is it, post, what do they call it now? Oh, post-traumatic stress. Yeah. yeah. And I, I came back, I went back to school, and life was normal. Mm -hmm. And I, and most of, at the there were a lot of former GIs back in college, and everybody seemed to fit together and and work. That's what had to be done. But uh, uh, nobody went to Canada to keep. Uh, wouldn't have done them any good because they might have been drafted up there. <laughs> but I think I came from a military background. My eighth generation great grandfather comes from Germany was really in 1725, sometime in, in, in that, about that time, they left Germany for religious oppression. He had four sons. Three of them were in the American Revolutionary War. The one that our family is, is derived from is referred to in the, in the genealogy as the Revolutionary Soldier. I had a, uh, my great granddad was in the Civil War. He died as a reason, later as a result from a wound that he received at the Battle of Chickamauga. My dad had a brother that died and was killed a month before the armistice in Germany or, or in France in World War One. Of course, I was drafted. 
and I had two uncles that were draftees. Well, the one was called from the National Guard, and my dad's youngest brother was a draftee in World War II. And as far as I know, everybody went just went back to what they were doing before. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'd like to go back. Uh, so, you, you, when you take me through leaving Camp Carson, we left Camp Carson in August of '44. I think that somebody <coughs> said it was 27 train loads. We went up through Chicago. I remember, and one of the fellows in my, the. the uh, squad that I was in, we parked along a railroad siding up there in Chicago for seemed like hours, and he says, I live three blocks right down the street. But he could not get off the train to, because we were, we were traveling under basically secret orders. We shipped out of New York, we landed in Cherbourg, France on the seventh day of December, 91 days after the invasion. We were the first division to land directly <coughs> on the continent from the States. Uh, what was memorable about the crossing? Did you go over on a Liberty ship? Or? We, we went all over on a ship that was commandeered from the, Russia, or from the Germans after World War I. Now we went the two trips the over and back one of them was on the John Erickson, and the other was on the George Washington. Now, I don't know which one was which right now, but uh, we went over on a regular ship, but they were loaded with troops. And I think the compartment that, uh, that I was in, I think was about 27 feet below the water line. But Any U-boat scares on the way over? Any U-boat scares on the way over, or were things pretty well calm? We were in a big convoy. Big convoy. I guess it was one of the largest convoys that they said at the time. But we had no problems. We were no. We had boat practice uh, almost every other day or so. All I think just to keep people busy, keep us, keep people alert. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we unloaded on a barge that was set up as a pier in Cherbourg. We were encamped in a small apple orchard, our company, in a small apple, apple orchard at Bonneville, France, next to the, along the coast. We had to go out every morning and pick up all the apples that had fallen off the trees. And, and then it, that day the, the French farmer would come to and pick, he had already had his apples picked up. <laughs> Um, so that's you. You got to France when? In September of forty-four. September forty-four. Now, uh, what were some of your uh, first impressions of of Europe? It, it's it's a long way uh, from uh, Elwood, Indiana. So it was very yeah. very cool, uh, different. I know uh, they had these things for the guys to relieve themselves along the street and they would just have a thing and they would be in there and then turn around talking to the, their wives or the people and it, it was strictly it, out of this world as far as we, and to me I was not used to something like that and uh, but uh, other than that we were not in France too long we made a couple of different moves in there. I remember I voted in my first presidential election from a foxhole in France in 1944. And, but then we moved up into Belgium and Holland and one little town we were outside I think a day or two before we actually got into combat. We went into this uh, Belgium town and there was a movie and we went, three or four of us went to the movie. We came out of the movie, there was one a little old lady there came up to us and she invited us to her house for dinner. And we gratefully accepted and asked her if there was anything that we could do. 
and she says, well, her husband was an invalid and they had trouble getting milk. So the next, that night, I went, got into the mess tent, I midnight requisitioned a gallon can of milk, and we took it the next day. And there were about four Canadian soldiers there also that she had invited. And they had taken Spam. And she had spaghetti and meatballs that was made with Spam. And it was good. And I don't know how many pies that lady had baked. But she would bring you, after we finished the meal, she would bring a big piece of pie. And by the time you finished it, and you couldn't say no, she had another piece sitting down there in front of you. But it was just, the people were so grateful at, the time, at that time that they would almost do anything. I remember one night we stayed, uh, normally, we would try, after we got into there, we would try to find some place inside to spend the night. We spent one night in a windmill, and I was surprised. You see a picture of a windmill, and you do not realize just how big they are until you actually see one. And it was enormous, but just the, the countryside and the, the people were all. But we were up in Belgium and Holland about a month, a month and a half, a short time. Okay. Well, uh, who'd you vote for in 44? What's that? Who did you vote for in 44? I don't remember. Yeah? I can't... I, was it, was it, did you vote for FDR? You vote for... They Arizona? were running against FDR. Yeah. <laughs> I did not, I did not, I got to be truthful. Well, I could tell from your Wilkie comment earlier yeah. that, that, that you didn't but, vote Democrat. Well, our family, yeah. Our Republicans. family was Republican. Yes. My dad was always involved in politics, and every time an election was over, he'd get involved, and after it was over, I'm done, I'm with him. <laughs> but uh, well, that was I do that, that was a tough period for Republicans. Yeah. yeah. I remember uh, going back when Roosevelt was a, uh, who was it? Al Smith. Mm hmm ran against Hoover. Hoover. Yeah, in 28, yeah. Yeah, and, tw and uh, I can remember we were down to Republican headquarters and the uh, results were coming in by telephone, I guess, but they were always posting the results. And afterwards, we went down to a local restaurant in town and we had a hamburger. And I, I can remember that at the first time we ever went out to eat. But we went and had a hamburger. I think it cost a nickel. <laughs> that was to console. Uh, well, no, he was happy. He was happy to celebrate. Yeah, yeah Hoover's victory. Yeah, yeah. but uh, well, um, you uh, now I know somewhere in here you were offered a promotion. Was that right? We were offered over in Germany in World War Two. We three of us were offered promotion to assistant squad leaders or squad leaders. And we turned it down because we had enough pro problem taking care of ourselves. That was the, I guess at that time we did not want the responsibility of, of other people's lives. Take, but we had, a, we had a good platoon leader and he would come down and take one of the guys from the squad to go pick a new position when we had to move. And we asked him, said, why don't you take the squad leader? He said, you don't know one of these days you may be the squad leader. Yeah. And that's just the kind of training that we had. Everybody went with it. Now this, when you were in France, and I know moving up in Holland and Belgium, most of that area was fairly secure. Yeah. By then, yeah. Yeah, it was. And we, where we were to start with, uh, we didn't see any uh, results of, the, of what had happened before, but but we moved through. I guess some of the, uh, we were normally our platoon was normally right behind an infantry company, mm -hmm. within a hundred yards or so. But some of them really had some rough times up in there. Uh, at night, uh, General Allen, our division commander, uh, 
pulled a lot of his attacks at night because he figured he could that the Germans were not ready for night attacks and that he would save a lot of lives and this I think he did throughout the time that we were there uh, we had 195 consecutive days on the line with contact with the German forces and we spent the winter in the Hurtgen forest in Germany one of the coldest winters they'd had in years and it wasn't too pleasant <laughs> Well, I'd, I'd like for you to, to walk me through uh, when you first encountered the war, the, the moment when you realized that you were involved in the war. Well, when we got up into Belgium and Holland, we set up a gun position on a, uh, a road, covering a road. We had the gun pretty well hidden, and we divided up well, we were set up in teams to pull two hours of guard and rotated and nothing, we, we saw nothing at that time. A couple of days later we were moved into another position and we had a small counterattack. We moved back a few hundred yards, not far, but the, the lieutenant we had had us pull back and then from then on uh, as far as, as I can remember, we went straight on through. Uh, there were times that we would get hit with a, uh, some, a barrage or a few artillery rounds. I can remember at night sitting there, you could hear the, the German, you could pick out the machine guns. The Germans, the machine gun they had at a much faster rate of fire than our little old water cool jobs and they finally got rid of the water cool but you hear that 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 just the, the difference and they, they were close enough you could hear and they were wondering just what was going on and uh, a lot of times we did not know the situation we would move into a position we knew we were to stay alert watch out watch what was going on and uh, that was that was about it uh, mm -hmm. uh, we did what we were told mm -hmm. yeah did, did y'all encounter any tank tanks we never encountered a tank thank goodness for that because <laughs> i don't think we would have with what we had and what they had i don't think at the time that we now if we could have got a broadside fine but I saw some of those tanks after they had been knocked out by heavier material, heavier ammo, and. Uh, but that thick armor plating and that 57 millimeter. When, and yeah. besides that, the Germans a lot of times on the front of their tanks they had concrete. They poured concrete over the the front of them, with in, in addition to the uh, armor plate, but. Uh, we did have a, a fire mission one night to fire harassing fire this was about Thanksgiving of 44 on a road junction where the Germans were pulling back and they figured that our we could harass them enough with what we had to keep keep them moving we fired 256 rounds we had two and three rounds at the air in the air at all times we could see the tracers, and we couldn't hear for three days afterwards. Mm -hmm. And that was before you had ear protection. Well, you hear pretty well now. Yeah. Well, I don't. I, I forgot my hear. I wear hearing aids. But you you hear pretty clearly now. Yeah. 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 I uh, I spent a lot of time after. I went back in the army on marksmanship detachments, not detachments, but a lot on marksmanship, both rifle and pistol, and uh, I enjoyed it. And uh, I enjoyed rifle matches. And, but. Well, well, um, in I know in December '44, which we're we're moving up a little bit, uh, the bulge begins, and so. 
if, if you could kind of give me your perspective of where your unit was uh, during the bulge. We were in Durham, Germany, along the Ruhr River, and we were about two, maybe 150, 200 yards back of the, from the river. We had troops down on the river, but they were uh, in guard positions as much as anything because we were there over a month, about a month or so. And I, we had our gun set up, it snowed and it was nicely camouflaged and covered. And one night they told us to stay inside and turn it, put out all the lights, make sure that no light was showing, that there was a German patrol coming across the river and not to bother them. And we stood there and one looked out the window and watched the German patrol walk up the street. A little bit later they went back. The next night they sent over a, a combat patrol and the cannon company behind us they called their forward observer and said, what's going on down there? And the only thing he would tell them, the fish are eating well. Because they were artillery fire on the river they were crossing. So they opened up on that combat. They opened group. up on the combat mm -hmm. patrol. Mm -hmm. And we could, we could sit there in the basement of that house, we could hear the rounds going uh, overhead. But the one nice thing that we did there we found a German ice cream hand crank freezer. We had a fellow in our squad that had been a cook in New York. He got all the stuff we needed to make ice cream. We set the freezer in a tub and, and packed snow around it. We got the ice cream ready, we put it in and we packed snow around that. But we had nothing to flavor it with. We went down to the street to the German uh, drugstore, we're looking for something to flavor our ice cream. We saw this bottle that had cherries on it and we thought that would make good flavoring. We went back and put it in our ice cream. We found out it was cherry cough syrup. But we ate our ice cream and our platoon sergeant called it the incredible ice cream <laughs> or ingenuity ice cream because we made do. <laughs> and it, it Kept you all from coughing too, probably. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I know the uh, other vets that I've interviewed, you're always looking for a, something else to eat. S something we're, a little more exciting than... than we were always yeah. well fed. Uh, we got, got our rations. And uh, at the time that we were in, in Duren, Germany, we holed up in a basement. Everybody had a nice, we got a bed, and we were living high on the hog as far as that goes, as far as combat. We had a stove where we would, we could heat our rations. If we had something else that we wanted, if we went out and found potatoes or something like that that we wanted, we could cook it, had space and, and the ability to cook. And the GIs always took care of themselves. I don't think, uh, I don't remember going hungry. We had a, a ton and a half Dodge the prime mover. We had a rack built up on the exhaust manifold. And when we were on the road, our rations went in that rack. And when we had time to eat, they were hot. And I don't know whoever came up with the idea, but it was a good one. <laughs> Did you develop strategies to keep yourself warm? Yeah. In the country? We, uh, a f few times, I think, I can remember being cold, but not not extremely cold. Not not to a, a, a dangerous or freezing, but in the hurricane forest that winter, it was cold, and you could dig a hole and get in it, and it, you could, we had enough clothing and equipment to keep warm. So, well, well take me through when the, the, the bulge breaks and you're able to move from that position. We crossed 
the river when the, the final push started on the way to Cologne and we were in that area. We pushed across and the, the resistance at that time was beginning to lack. There were still some pockets that were difficult to break, but we were moving pretty rapidly. The night before we went into Cologne, we could not our get could not get our guns up. So we were divided in or split up into bazooka teams, two of us to a, a team. We went up with one of the re, uh, infantry platoons. And that night, before we would go into Cologne the next morning, the Germans threw in a barrage that felt like you could just reach out and grab a round coming in. If you had a baseball glove, you'd have been in good shape. And I was thinking, this is the end, this is as far as we're going, that they, they finally co consolidated and that's it. We got up the next morning, walked across the city of Cologne, they routed one German soldier out of his own house, sent him back to a POW camp. We found out later what they had done is threw that barrage in on us that night to keep us in undercover so they could pull all their troops back across the Rhine River. I see. So it was cover for their retreat back across that, the Rhine. That's, uh, yeah. And we crossed the river a few days later south of the Remagen Bridge because the Remagen Bridge was was gone, mm -hmm. and I can remember this pontoon bridge, they had a sign on there that said, built by Jepson of Jayhawk, assisted by Jeff, uh, something that started with a J, the U.S. Navy. Jayhawk of Jackpot, that's what, what and assisted by Jepson, U.S. Navy, and across the pontoon bridge. Well, you know, I'd like to ask, because I, you already talked about you were a man of faith, and, and, and you're, you're a Baptist and church had always been important. Uh, are, are there times when you're dug in and you're under artillery fire that you, uh, that you really turn to prayer or those sorts? Well, of things? I guess yeah. we were concerned. Yeah. I can remember one time over there in a German gas house, a chaplain came in and they, there was beer and uh, the guys were drinking he came in, he scooted everything down the bar, set up his stuff. We had a chapel service. After it was over, he says the bar's open and went right back. But, oh, and in our reunion last August, one of the chaplains from World War II was there. And he held a memorial service on Sunday morning. But they, I remember the chaplains, uh, one of them, they had threatened to court martial him because he disobeyed the or an order. He went out with the medics to help bring back wounded off the battlefields, and he was told not to, but they didn't court martial him. They presented him with a silver star. <laughs> but uh, we, there were chaplains available all the time. Uh, at times that you were involved or were they, but they would come up and hold service wherever, whenever, and wherever. Mm -hmm. And uh, now my wife and I, I guess in one of the couple of places in Germany we were very involved with the chapel. And when I retired we sort of got away from it for a while and a friend of ours was going to the chapel while at Biggs, which is now Fort Bliss East, and we got to going out there, and a lot of the people at that chapel are retired, and they're holding the chapel together because it's the Sergeant Major's Academy uh, chapel, and of course they come in in August and leave the next year, and so it's a, a continuing process of keeping people there, but. We show up on Sunday morning, and my wife and I were very involved in the chapel. And I know that uh, the chaplain, the one chaplain out there, was very was at the house quite often. Uh,
from January until she passed away. And she told him, she says, I'm ready to go. I got two requests. I want a closed casket and I want a graveside service. And I told Chaplain Jeffries, I says, I will go with the closed casket, but we will have a chapel service. Mm -hmm. And a week ago, yesterday, or a year ago yesterday, we had the chapel service and she was buried at Fort Bliss. And on my way to chapel, Every Sunday morning, I stop. And I talk to her. This past week has been difficult. As I said, we were, we were husband and wife. We were mother and father. She and I were great friends. She was my pal, my buddy. Yeah, 65 years of marriage. Yeah. Yeah. We were married in November of 46. I graduated from college in 49. I would go someplace and go to work and I would be enthused and six months I was fed up with it. 1950 I enlisted in the reserves. I got into a unit that did NCOs and because I had prior military service I got two quick promotions to an E6. In 1953, I went, November 53, I went back on active duty as an E6. And at that time, I, a senior NCO because they just had E6s and E7s. Mm -hmm. But uh, I finally made E7. When I made get a e, got promoted, I didn't get to change my stripes. I went from an SFC E6 to an SFC E7. Mm -hmm. But. When I decided to go back, I told her, I said, I would like to go back to the Army. If you will approve, I said, if not, if you don't want to go, I said, we part friends. And she says, I took you for better or for worse, we'll go. Mm -hmm. And I had one out of, I went back in November 53, I retired in 71. And in that time, I had one unaccompanied tour. We had a lot, a lot of field work and the like, we were maybe a week at a time, but that was the longest. But she went with you everywhere. She went, it, she, she spent uh, six years in Germany. I had the unaccompanied tour in, o in Thailand. And then we spent the last tour was in Okinawa. And our daughter had been, was married at that time and our son was still with us. And I think, I think it, the tour in Okinawa helped him in his business. When he first got into this business, they were doing a lot of work with Japanese. And they were just starting. And one of the meetings they had in, Cal, in LA, one of the big wheels from the Japanese company was there. And Bill's company needed some upfront money. And they finally got it, but this old Japanese guy was ratting in a raven. And after it was over, they left there, and Bill's partner at that time says, boy, I thought we'd lost that job. Bill says, no, he was just holding, keeping up face, holding face. As the Japanese, he learned this from Okinawa. Mm -hmm. They learned part of the Japanese customs. That's Maintain how they... Face, yeah. 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 Well, um, I'd like to go back, and so we've crossed uh, into uh, Germany, um, and so you're moving. Uh, take me through the Hurtgen Forest. I know we were Hurtgen Forest is between 
Aachen, Germany, and Duren. I have a book upstairs that is called The Longest Battle. And in that length of time, it's 19 miles from Aachen to Germany, or to Duren. And it took us over two months to, to, to battle our way not not just our division, but the whole bunch, the whole, the whole army along there. It took that much time just to clear through that much that territory. Mm -hmm. The Germans were still put. They were at that time were putting up a good battle, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it was it was rough. It was cold. It was miserable, but we survived. We got through, and one way. Uh, well, I guess about Christmas time, it, it started to slacken off a little bit. Now I could never place whether we were, I think probably south of where the bulge was actually took place. Uh, we were far enough, but we were just in a holding pattern at that time. When we were in Durham, in Durham Germany, it was, uh, it was just a holding pattern there while they were clearing out and at Bastogne. And, but uh, we, as far as my, where I was, we were never in any real, I guess you were in danger all the time. Sure. But I could never remember any, any critical times. Uh, other than that night in, in Cologne, mm -hmm. but other than that, uh, took care. We were concerned. I was concerned, but that was the one of the times over there that I I was really, uh, really concerned about my safety and everybody else's. Just to, the fact of what they were were doing. One night we were sitting along a roadblock, no moon not knowing where we were or what was going on. And we heard a bud curdling screech and I think everybody jumped about that high. We found out the next morning we were sitting beside one of Goring's estates and that was one of his, pe one of the peacocks. Let out this screech and I've never heard anything like it in my life. Well, um, uh, as you said, things break uh, and, and late January, February, you're moving much quicker on into Germany. Into Germany yeah. and, and the like, and uh, we had a few rough spots, but normally you could move through pretty fast. In fact, is one night we were the medical unit and we had they had a, a German regiment surrender to a medical unit. And they, of course, uh, to the medical unit because that the highest com officer in the group was the medic. Was the medic, <laughs> but we were with the, our our platoon was with uh, a medical unit moving up, and that it was funny at the time because the doctor didn't know what to do with. <laughs> But it, but it was a sign of, of what was going on. It was a sign of what was going on. Uh, one place we were, and a thousand times since then, I wished I had kept a journal. I could remember some of these things that happened. We were sitting, set up on a hill, and an open field in front of us, the woods off to the left, and this little old lady every day We'll go out in the woods with a basket and come back. Well, one day I decided to keep an eye on her. She went out there and there was a German soldier. It was her son. She was taking him food. He was hiding in the woods. He, his war was over. Well, we took her and, and his, her son back and turned them over to the authorities, but they, I think they released them. And then there was one walking across the field about 500 yards out, our lieutenant was there. He says, drop a 50 round behind that guy's heels. I'm gonna go get him. 
and I fired one round and I think it hit about three feet behind him. And he says, I didn't want you to scare him to death. I want to talk to him. But he went out and brought the man back. But that was, I, I love that 50 caliber. That's, that's one reason I wear hearing aids, because I put it up in a belfry at, in Durham, in a school, and I was shooting out across the, but it backed up into the, into the belfry and it perforated an eardrum. But that, I don't know, it, it was an experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we, we moved across, we got moving pretty fast at times. We got to Nordhausen. Well, I'd like you to walk me through that, uh, just coming upon Nordhausen, because I know it was unexpected. So, and the factory and then the... We did not get into the factory. Okay. Uh, but we saw the bodies. So you approached the camp. First. We approached the camp. Yeah. And uh, I know somebody come back and said they've found uh, a concentration camp. They've taken it. And we went up to see what was going on. And there were bodies of building there that had stairwells, and there were bodies stacked under a stairwell like cordwood. They were laying out in the streets. And the medics come up, they brought up a medical battalion because some of them were still alive. And some of them were so weak that just a weak, warm broth did them in. They were that far gone to start with. But the, the, and the people in Nordhausen, they denied knowing it was going on. But they found out in a hurry, they came out and had to clear up all the bodies. All of the male residents of the city of Nordhausen, they had them out picking up bodies. But we were there just a, a couple of days after that that we moved on, and that was, uh, but I, I still cannot realize why people deny the fact that it took place. I know they did, I took it, I, had, I saw it. We had other places where we got into a town or places where they had just slave labor. They were, and the people we saw, they were some were Russian, uh, Polish, all nationalities of people that were just slave laborers for the German uh, forces. Mm -hmm. And I hope we go back, I'd like to to go into the, the, the factories at Nordhausen were in a cave. And that's where they were building the rockets, were in the cave. And I would like to go back and have a chance to even look at those or see what, see what remains there. But I know in 60 some years, there's not gonna be much I'm gonna recognize. Well, did you get a chance to, did you go into the camp and tour the camp of Nordhausen? Well, it was just a big factory building, like a factory building. And that's where they, and uh, I've seen the, the pictures of some of the others where they were just stacked into places and the food that they got was not, I guess, warm water with uh, maybe potato and cabbage stuck in it, but that, that was the food they had. And they were just worked to death. Now we did not get any of the places like uh, Ansch, Ansch, what, uh, Auschwitz, Auschwitz yeah. and the like where they had the big ovens, and but this was just a factory, and the, these people were wor uh, just worked, worked to death. But that did you have any any interactions with any of the people that were in the camp? No, we didn't. The, the, the medics were doing their work and we tried to stay out of their way. They had a job to do and, and I, I felt for them, for, the, for what they had to put up with there. But the, the, the people were just skin and bones. I try to, to 
you see these guys at these athletic events with these suits on that cover their body. Well, that's just about what it looked like with the skin stretched over a skeleton. And that's it, it was a horrible sight to see, and as I said, it just it's difficult to think how can people deny the fact that this happened. Did you have any, uh, had you heard of these sorts of places before? You I guess we'd heard of them, but, uh, and I don't, as far as I can uh, know, we came, I came, we came upon this, as far as I'm concerned, unexpectedly. But they, they found it and uh, there were two of them, Nordhausen and Dora, the two concentration camps that the 104th was involved in liberating. And uh, it, it's, it's a horrible picture to see and you just can't realize the physical damage that was done. And I think most of these people that, that died in these camps, like Nordhausen, I think they were all buried in a common grave. Or they would bring in a bulldozer and dig a grave and the bodies were all placed in there with no, no nothing done. Just, I guess to cover them up, to get them out, to keep the d disease and whatever, uh, any kind of something spread, spreading and just sanitary reasons as much as anything. Well now were you, you mentioned the the people from the town coming out to, do, did you witness that where they came out to help? They were, they brought up, they brought some out to show, show them. Well I remember they did have some but and they were just starting to clear up when we moved through and there's not much recognition of that, but I know they did, they did bring them out and uh, to clear the bodies out. But other than that, I, I could, in the unit history, I've read some of it, and but I don't recall seeing any of it. And all of those places over there where these concentration camps were, the Germans denied it, denied even knowing they were there. And how their propaganda minister must have been great because they did not, they would not confess to knowing these places were there. And I, they can't keep something like that, that, that close. Well, you know, one thing that that other liberators have talked about is comparing that scene to a battlefield and, and how it's different. In the battlefields, I think bodies were cleared up. The GIs, both sides, in fact, is there's time that they call truces over there so the wounded and the like could be cleared off of a battlefield. I know this had happened, but there, there was nothing. These people, I don't know who stacked them, whether they had the people that were the slave laborers to, to clean out the bodies and stack them up like that or lay them out in the streets, but they were laid in a parking, like a parking lot, just rows and rows of, of bodies. But there were still a few that were alive and alive. In fact is there were a couple of ladies here, well, I moved in in January or in, in June, there were a couple of ladies here that come out of a concentration camp and Jeannie, the nurse, they had a large memorial service, uh, Holocaust Memorial at the Jewish synagogue over here on Thunderbird. And on Wednesday she called me and she says, I will be by Sunday afternoon at one o'clock and pick you up to take you to the memorial service. 
and sh sure enough, she was there. She picked me up and we come out here to the synagogue. And as people came in, she introduced me as a liberator. And they were all thankful. These, and then Mr. Kellen was a survivor of one of the, of the uh, Holocaust. And I'd met him before. I've been involved in two or three of the other Holocaust memorials. And he was there, and Jeannie told me, she says, Mr. Kellen wants to talk to you. And we were going to go out to lunch. And Mr. Kellen wasn't feeling well, and they had to cancel the lunch. And I haven't seen Mr. Kellen or heard from him since. But uh, this is where Jeannie got my information. One of the units at Fort Bliss made up a big thing about the memorial, and they have it on the wall down there at the at the museum. I see. They they enlarged it and put our pictures, and that's where she saw my picture. I see. Well, uh, you talk about these occasions. What, it is it, what has it meant to you to be recognized? Well, I guess I feel proud. And I help somebody else in a way, in a, a small way. But it, uh, I feel good about it. I, I don't know. It, it's a good feeling to help somebody or be involved in trying to to help history. History I liked. That's, that was my main uh, deal. I wanted to be a history teacher. And uh, but, uh, it, it's a good feeling to be recognized as somebody that did good for someone else. If that's a way of putting it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the one that they had over here at the uh, synagogue, they had all the veterans that were there to stand up. And I, we were sitting way in the back, and other noises I did not quite understand. Jeannie poked me in the ribs and said, Stand up, stand up. So I did. And there at the end, the lady that was the MC of the program, she says, we are honored to have a liberator in our midst today. And she started through the biography that they had uh, on this memorial that this had out of Fort Bliss. And Jeannie again was poking me in the ribs and telling me, stand up, stand up. <laughs> <laughs> and I stand up by myself then, but it was, people appreciated. At least to me, it showed their appreciation. Even though the Jewish community itself, the people that were not involved, they appreciated it. And the ones that were really involved in, in the uh, Holocaust, the, the two ladies here, they appreciated somebody that, that knew what happened. That could tell what happened. Yeah. Well, um, so you spent a short time at, at Nordhausen itself. Yes. Yeah. We should. We were. I guess maybe a, a day or a day and a half. I know we did. Some of us did walk down there and see what was going on. The medics were taking care of what would, they could do, and we moved on. We, we still had a job to do other than that. Uh, we ended up, well, this was what, in April? Mm -hmm. And of course, then just shortly after that, it was all over. And we were in a little town. We went, well, our battalion, the first battalion of our regiment, went round behind the city of Holly. And to block off any Germans coming out to try to hold them within the compound of the city. And then uh, we end up in a little town about 13 kilometers northeast of Leipzig, Germany, called Krostitz, K-R-O-S-T-I-T-Z. And 
there was a school hall, school room there, and the schoolmaster's house was attached. And our squad was staying in that school room. And when the war was over, and one night he came into the schoolroom and wanted to know if we would like to come into the, the his house and, and just talk. And he spoke enough English that we could get along with a fine conversation. We tried to get him to take down these blackout curtains. And we could not convince him that the war was over, that he did not need blackout curtains but he went around the table and he asked each individual in our squad our name. And the first guy was, his last name was Mahoney. He says, oh, Irish. And he went around and each man and he could tell the ethnic background. And he got to me and he says, and I told him Danner, he says, ah, oh, Deutsch. And I can remember one of the towns that we went through at apartment house, we were clearing it. We would go through after the infantry and make sure that the buildings were clear. And there was an apartment there with the name Danner on the door. And my great eighth generation great grandfather came from, from Germany. Well, um, I, I know you had the chance to encounter Russian troops were there as well. In the one Russian, one, one Russian, Russian troop, and that was the biggest man I'd ever seen in my life. And these German people come up to me and they were saying something about this Ruski, Ruski. And I went down with them. They wanted me to go with them. And I went down by myself like an idiot. And there was this big guy standing there rattling off and something. And I, yeah, yeah, Deutschland kaput. And I turned around and left. <laughs> but it did, but there was some funny things that happened, you know. And, but I, I wanted no part of that guy. He was big. <laughs> um, I know at this point you don't have enough points to get out of the of the army. I know they're on the point system. So had you you hadn't accumulated enough points to be discharged yet, had you? No. Yeah. We were one of the first divisions that was redeployed from Germany from the Europe battle back to the States and our orders at that time were to go to San Luis Obispo, California, get all of our equipment back and get it unpacked and get ready. And we were to go to Manila in the Philippines for amphibious training. And we were to be one of the invasion divisions about 40 miles below Tokyo in Tokyo Bay. And the day my 30 day leave was up when we came back from Germany, the war with Japan was over. And then we went out there and they set us up as a discharge station and uh, as the companies, as the guys with the points were out, the companies grew smaller, they started consolidating companies and they needed cooks and I couldn't see due to a close order drill and a manual of arms and I went in the kitchen and trained as a cook and I spent my last few months in the army as an army cook. Mm -hmm. Well. Um what was the reception like in New York uh, in that July? We landed in New York. 35,000 troops from Germany came, landed in New York that day, the same day. And as far as they brought out a boat of, I think it was at that time a WAC band, women, on one side of the troop ship and 15,000 troops went to that side of the ship and almost capsized it. And after that, they started bringing out one on both sides of the ship. But there were 35,000 troops come back from uh, Europe that one day. Mm -hmm. And we went into Fort Dix, New Jersey, and got in there late at night. The mess sergeant apologized that he did not have steak dinners for us 
because that's what they were giving the troops when they came back. But he says, I guarantee you, you will have a steak for dinner tomorrow. And the next day, we had steak. They loaded us onto car, on railroad cars, Pullmans, what have you, and took us mainly to a, an area where we were going to spend our 30-day leave. And we got into Indiana, out of Indianapolis. We started down to Camp Atterbury. The train stopped along the football field of Franklin College where I went to school. And the, la the young lady I was going with at the time, she was over there in the dormitory. And I could not get off the train. <laughs> but uh, that uh, we got a, a 30 day leave, reported back to Camp Atterbury, and I ended up at uh, San Luis Obispo, California. Well, what was the homecoming like? It was great. Uh, I got home. Well, I got discharged. And I went back to Louisiana State. I went back to Louisiana State University because a lot of friends I knew down there. And I went to the fraternity house and they says, so, where are you staying? I said, I got a hotel room. That won't do. They went down and checked, me, checked my stuff out of the hotel room and I stayed at the fraternity house for two or three days. And when I got home, it was about two o'clock in the morning and at that time, you did not lock doors. I went in through the back. Of course, we always come into the back where we lived. That was the easy, quickest way home, was in the, up the alley and home. And I went in and I laid down on the couch in the living room and I pulled my overcoat up over me. My dad got up the next morning and he came down and he's getting ready to go to work. He said, well, I'll be damned. You finally decided to come home. <laughs> But that was, uh, I guess, uh, afterwards, after I got back into school the next year, I'd worked for J.C. Penney in high school. And I went up home for Easter, and I forgot to take a dress shirt to go to church. My dad and I walked down to the Penney store on Saturday morning, and I walked in, and Mr. Squire, the manager of the store when I worked there, walked up, handed me a sales book and a pencil that says, get to work. And I told him, Mr. Squire, I did not come down to work. I come down to buy a shirt. He says, I need somebody here that knows what's going on. And that, that made me feel good. Uh -huh. But uh, it, it was a small town, 10,000 people. So, so what were you studying in school when you got back in? I wanted, at that time, I wanted to be a coach and teach chemistry. That was my, uh, my dream, I guess. And I would take chemistry courses and I had a, we had a good chemistry professor there at the time. I could take his class notes and I would have a student plan, a lesson plan for that particular class because he was so thorough in the way he did it. And then he left and they brought in a young professor. He might have known chemistry, but he could not teach me chemistry. So I changed my major to, to uh, sociology. I have a degree in sociology and my first job after I got out of school was an assistant county supervisor at the Indiana Boys School at Plainfield, Indiana. I worked, went to work at six o'clock in the morning. I got off at eight o'clock at night. I had about two hours off of an afternoon. I had one day off every two weeks and one weekend out of every four. And that was a lot of hours. Yeah. And I left there and went to a bank in Indianapolis as a, re, as a teller. I ended up, when I went back into the Army, I was a, a expediter in Class Q allotments at the Army Finance Center 
in Indianapolis at Fort Benjamin Harrison. Mm -hmm. And by being in reserves, I found out how much money those guys were making. They were making more than I was. And I got tired of working two jobs, so I went back to the Army. Mm -hmm. Now, when you went back in, what was your assignment right when you went back in? I went back in, I, uh, working there as an expediter. What I would do, we had these people, the people were processing allotments for the military. And they would come up with something that was, that they didn't know how to take care of. They would give it to me or one of the other expediters. We would go find out the problems, get it solved, and go back and tell them what to do. And one day I was going to check it on something else, and I came across two files. <coughs> had the same serial number with the exception of the last four, and they have been transposed. And I thought, that is funny, we got two people here with the same name and uh, identical numbers, a social security number. And I got to looking, and all the correspondence for that allotment, there was a master sergeant, all the correspondence was written by a lady handwritten check, uh, mail. The letters would be written, mail from the same post office at the same time, the same handwriting. And I went back and I told my supervisor, I says, I think I have found something here. And I told him, he says, you go back and check the pay vouchers way back to when. Find out how much this, and I went back and, and, and the allotment was immediately dropped. But every time at the change of station, this lady would write two letters and mail them. And what had happened, someplace along the line, some clerk had mistyped the last four numbers of the serial number. But this, I guess maybe she did not let her husband know that she was getting two checks. <laughs> But this is one thing. My wife knew much about what was going on, as I did. Uh -huh. And she kept track of everything. And something didn't feel right. She was on the phone finding out, getting it corrected. But this allotment was stopped right then. I don't know what ever happened to this. <laughs> well, now, how did you end up in the missile, in a missile unit? I was an MP. Yeah. I liked the MP. Yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to make it a career. And the military I would I I was a desk sergeant. I handled the desk. Uh, we worked 8 hours and was off 24. And I got involved with the MPI, Military Police Investigators in a lot, a lot of the cases that we had. And I they wanted me they wanted me to be transferred from the MPs up to their MPI. And my company commander would not release me. That's one thing, doing a good job kept me where I didn't want to be. Because there were no promotions. And I knew if I got into MPI, I could proceed on up into the criminal investigation. And most of those people were warrant officers. And I could have gone to school the MP school and to, to the, what I needed and could have gotten a, a promotions. But he would not release me and at that, about that time they were coming out with the missile systems and I thought, well, that's a, a new field. I could get into it and maybe have a little better chance. And I applied for the Corporal Missile School, the ground guidance, as they called it at the time, here at Fort Bliss and was accepted and I came out here to school and I went to 32 weeks of school. I got out, I was assigned to a unit here and got into the unit. The battery commander says, I have all the ground guidance people I need. He says, you have the electronic training. Would you be willing to go in to the assembly and test section? I said, it makes no difference to me, that's fine. When I was at school here, 
when I left the MPs, they had the specialist trainings at that time. And my company commander, I did him a favor. He asked me if I would accept an E6 specialist. And so he could keep the NCO rank. And I said, that's fine because I'll be going to school and that's fine with me. And I got out, I went back to the unit or assigned to a unit and about a week after I got there, I got a new assignment as a job. I went into the battery commander. I said, now that I'm working as a, a non-commissioned officer, I would like to have my NCO stripes back. And that night, he handed me a set of orders, convert me from an SFC specialist, or a six, E6 specialist to an E6 NCO. And I spent 10 years in the corporal missile system the last unit I was in was the last corporal unit in the Army. It was deactivated. They sent in a Pershing unit in Germany. I was assigned to it. The unit wasn't even there. And when I did come back, I decided I had all the missile training units that I wanted. And I went to the Pentagon. I got a, a, my assignment changed to engineer school at Fort Belvoir and went through several classes and stayed on at Fort Belvoir for, I was there for four years and had an instructor group teaching diesel engine driven generators and I had to work with them, I had instructors and I had to do the lesson plans and scheduling, class scheduling and the like and I enjoyed that and I had to, I taught classes and but then uh, they come up with a, a course, a 621A MOS, Military Occupation Specialty, Specialty which was Heavy Equipment Maintenance. I took that course and after I got out of that, finished the course, I applied for a warrant and was assigned or got appointed as a warrant officer, heavy equipment maintenance. And uh, the job I had there, uh, uh, if I could have found a civilian job like that, I would probably stayed in it. But I was program manager for engineering equipment rebuild. We would get a telegram from Vietnam telling us we were sending back 20 Cat 12 graders, Caterpillar Road graders. They would be on the island at such and such a time. And it was my job when Elton got on the island to have the parts to completely do a depot rebuild. Mm -hmm. They were completely dismantled and it was my job to see that those things were, when they left the shop, they were like new. Mm -hmm. That was an interesting, yeah, you enjoyed that work. It, it was good work, and uh, I had a good crew to work with, and the only one lady over there gave me a problem one time, caused me problems. They sent back some small Caterpillar tractors that the Army had bought for the Vietnamese. And they were not in the U.S. Army inventory. So I went through and I changed all the military part numbers to Caterpillar, or changed all the Caterpillar numbers into, uh, and this was when computers was done on cars. And I made up the list of parts. And I sent it, and I had to run through the computer. There were some, a few gaskets and seals that were common, but not enough to worry with. So I went back and reconverted all the numbers in the Caterpillar. I set up a letter with all the parts that we needed, the number we needed each, the price per each, the total cost, the whole works. I took it back to this one lady, she was a GS-14. I took it back to her and I said, this is what I have done, one, two, three. I said, all this needs is a letter, for a procurement letter for a private company. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm not pushing anybody, but the closest place to get these parts 
is the Caterpillar place in San Mateo, California, or straight to Caterpillar itself. And the Colonel kept wanting to know we had a meeting every week. And the Colonel wanted to know what's the status on the Caterpillar, on the dozer. What's the I said, well, I've turned it over to so-and-so. Well, check with her and see what she's done. And she has sat there and doing the same thing I had done. She was doing the whole thing over. When I left the island in August of 71, she was still converting part numbers. They, sp they may still not have those dozers. They, they? St they still may not. <laughs> but the, so many of these people were doing, they were keeping their jobs. Yeah. That's what they were doing. Well, how was the transition back out of the military? I came back, I went back, I went back to school. <clears throat> I was living in a fraternity house. And of course all these GIs, well most of us were, were ex-military. And we would, they would, we'd sit around at night and tell stories. We had this one fellow that was in the Air Force. He was a gunner on a B-29 in the Pacific. And there at the end, he would tell them about they would fly off one island up someplace, they were dropping uh, supplies on what was now Korea at that time of Formosa. Mm -hmm. They were dropping supplies Sounds up yeah. there for the yeah. prisoners of, that were there. Mm -hmm. And on the way back one time they stopped swimming, and they were having problems. They stopped at an airport, one of the army airfields that night. And they stole a jeep from some, and they put it in a bomb bay. The next day they got ready to leave and the, the post was almost closed. And they told the pilot that they had this jeep that they were looking for in the bomb bay. And they were out someplace over the Pacific. He says, open the bomb, board, bomb bay doors and dispose of that thing. <laughs> They dropped it in the Pacific, but he would come in at night, be about half tanked. He would say, and "There we were, twenty thousand feet over Undy Bundy." The next morning we'd get up, he'd sober up. We'd ask him, "Hey, Dal, where's Undy Bundy?" I don't know, never heard of it. <laughs> but went back to school, and it was just like it was before. Mm -hmm. We went to class. And of course, I started in the fall of 42. And fall, in, fall of 72, right? Uh, no, I started back to school in the fall of 40. Uh, I started at college in the 40, yeah. in, originally. Yes, yeah. I got back and started back in in 46. Yeah. And that June, my class graduated. The class that I would have been in had I not been in the service. And you talk about somebody being downhearted. Mm -hmm. And I was about ready at that time to go to just drop out of school and go back to the to the military. And one of the young ladies on the campus, she was just a, a friend that I knew, and she sat me down that afternoon and talked to me all afternoon and talked me into staying in the school. And I forget who it was, but I should have gone back and thanked her a thousand <laughs> times that for for that, because due to that, uh, I did graduate. I was happily married, and life was great after that. Yeah. Well, now when you retired in '71, what did you do after that? We we thought we were going to live in Colorado, as I said, but then we moved back to El Paso. Yeah, and I had worked part time up there in Colorado at Sears, was a part time. And we came back, and I really hadn't decided 
just what what I wanted to do. And I worked several different jobs. I would be go work uh, at the state personnel or uh, employment office, temporary. And finally I decided, by golly, I was going to go back to school. I had GI Bill left. I went back, I took enough courses to qualify to get my uh, certification to teach. I needed 18 hours over what I had. And I took 51 hours, most of it was history courses. Just to, uh, I had the time and the like, and in 1977, I started teaching, uh, at that time was called an alternative program. These were habitual truants, troublemakers and the like, and they were put into a classroom. And we had to teach them all the classes that they had. Well, English, history, whatever, we would go to their the teacher and get their lesson plans, and we would teach it. That they had uh, two other two young ladies in the classroom with me, and then finally I was the only one in the in the room, and it was right across the hall from the assistant principal's office. These students were isolated from the rest of the student body. The door was the classroom door was closed, and. They brought two young men from one of the junior high down there one time and put in that class. One of them come up to me one day in the classroom and he said, what would you do if I'd hit you? I said, I'd grab you by the nap of the neck and the seat of the pants and throw you right across the hall to Mr. Elwood's office. That was assistant principal. And I wouldn't even bother opening the door. He says, I was only kidding. I says, I wasn't. They didn't know they were messing with an old Army old warrant officer and NCO. But I never had any problems after that. Well, um, you were talking about before we started recording about how you enjoyed teaching history. Yeah, I, uh, I would get an American history. I, this, my student teaching was in Western Settlement. And to me, that's the most of interesting part of history but then you get into American history and I would open the book and I would look to see where we were and I close the book and I would start the lecture and telling stories about what <clears throat> what I knew at the time and they would say how do you know all this I was there when it happened you know you, you get raised during a depression and the like and you know what goes on and so I said, I would tell him a guy came, my dad was out of work. Well, about two of the family, friend, family, family friends or family all living in the same house, trying to survive. A man came to the door, asked, offered my dad a job for 15 or $5 a week. And the kids would say, well, how did you survive? Great. We would go to town on Saturday night. My mother and dad would give my daughter or my sister and I a dime and we'd go to movies. We'd get a nickel to get in the movie and a nickel to buy a bag of popcorn. And that was a, we, we lived great. We had, we had plenty, we, we weren't, we never suffered, but that was, and, but I enjoyed history and I took a, a one of the classrooms in Russian history, and but I just enjoyed the. I had some good professors. One of them was really did me a favor. One of the final exams, I misread the schedule, and I was sitting in the student union going over my notes for that particular test. And this gal walked in from the class and she says, you missed the history test. Oh, and I went dashing back over at the room and I told the professor, he said, I went in, he gave me the test and when they have all finished, he says, when you finish the test, you bring it down to me and I'll, 
but he gave me a break. But I, I enjoy I enjoyed kids, and I got along with them. I knew who who I had to get on. I knew who I could tease and joke with, and and the like. And of course, being here in, in El Paso, a lot of them were Hispanic. And one day, a bunch of them in the back of the room was cutting up, and I says, "You guys settle down, or I'm going to get the Mexican mafia after you." And then we are the Mexican mafia. <laughs> I I knew I knew who I could read people in in that way. Yeah. And I had one one time. I had a student teacher. The last semester I taught. And after she got on her feet into the classroom, I would leave for that. That was her class. And I went in one day after after I had she had had a class. They had a test that day. And I walked into the classroom to see how she was doing. And she says, uh, this one student came in to her and said he had an appointment with his counselor. Did he have a pass? No. I said, let me check. And I went and she said, his counselor says, I haven't seen him all semester. So I went back, I picked up the class, the grade book, I put a big red X in the, for him for that day, which meant an unexcused absence that he could not take his test. I called him in, and I talked talk to him. I said, now if you want to graduate, here's what you have to do the rest of this semester. You have to maintain at least a 76 average just to graduate. I said, if you want help before class, I'm here every morning at seven o'clock, you come in and I will help you. I will not give up my lunch hour. I said, if you want to stay after school, you let me know a day or two ahead of time, because I normally have things scheduled after school, and I want to be able to help. Well, he never asked for help. And he came in when he found out he wasn't going to graduate. He came in, and he got all over me. He said, I'm going to tell the principal you helped these girls, and you wouldn't help me. Well, about the first thing I ever told a class when they came into a classroom, if I can help you, if you need help with this course or any course, come and talk to me. We'll see what we can do. Because I want to see him graduate. And I said, if you want to talk to the principal, that's your prerogative. But I beat him to the principal's office. And I told him what happened. He walked in before he could say anything. The principal says, we'll see you in summer school. But that. And I had one in the alternative program. His biggest problem was English language, the lack of English. And he would get frustrated and start missing class and what have you. And I'd get him back online, they put him back in the class, and the next thing you know, he was back again. And I told him one time, I says, you're going to have to do this on your own and stay in class. And said, if you want to graduate. And he came to me one day after he was back in the class and handed me an invitation to his graduation mm -hmm. because he had settled down and gotten serious enough, got into class and graduated. Well, that was the time when teaching was most rewarding in times. Like yeah, well, that makes you. Yeah. And I had, a, I had quite a few students mm -hmm. that. I wanted to see graduated and graduate, and I tried to help them. But uh, as I said, I like the kids. I build youth clubs for the Optimist. I built three three youth clubs, and this last one, the principal at Western Hills. She was the Optimist Club I belong to are partners in education with a, one of the elementary schools on the east side. And the principal they had when I joined this club is the principal at Western Hills now. Her mother and father are members of our Optimist Club. Mm. And I would go by Western Hills almost every, oh, I go out that way 
to when I leave up here. And I called Tony. Well, I thought several times I went by this school, knowing that Nancy was the principal there, it would probably be an easy way to get a, a youth club started. And I called her mother one day and I said, you think Nancy would be willing to have an alpha club, which is elementary grade, at Western Hills? She says, well, I'm sure she would. She says, let me give her a call and I'll have her give you a call. A couple of days later, I got a call from Nancy, and she says, I'm, on, I, I'm interested in this Alpha Club. She says, come over. She set up an appointment. So I went over and talked to her, and I had a, a notebook with all the information in it. <laughs> that was Robbie. No. <laughs> but uh, she called me. I took it over and explained to her what it was. She said, well, let me look this over and I'll give you a call. And about a week later, she called and she says, I have 30 kids. And that we're going over Friday and present them with their charter. Well, that's great. Well, you and our club, we pay all their, it doesn't cost the kids or the school a dime. We pay all their dues. We pay for the charter, to charter the club and all. And the fact is on the 22nd day of May, we are going to take them to the zoo. At no cost to the kids. And what aggravated me, we did this two years ago. And I had to drop out, because that's when my wife was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And I had to drop out and I uh, helped them with that because somebody else had to take over the work that I would have done. But anyway, they set up the, the tour and some of our club members wanted to go. They thought they were going to get a free tour of the zoo. But when they found out they had to pay their own way, they, they, would, they couldn't help. But me, I am going to the zoo. I will pay my way and anybody else that wants to go, I will help them. Well, you, you continue to work for the benefit of, of kids. I know you like working with kids. Yeah. And, uh, well, uh, Chief Danner, we've taken a lot of your time this morning, but Not I, I want to make sure, were, were there things we should have asked and gotten into that we didn't get a chance to talk about? Well, okay, whatever. I, I'm i free. I, <laughs> my time is... Well, were there some, as we wrap up, are there some things we we need to talk about that we haven't talked about so far, maybe that we missed. Well, I don't know. I, okay. uh, I've been on the inter well, yeah, on the internet, iPad, working with it. And I went back to this little town that we were in at the end of, it, it's probably not little anymore. But I would like to go back there. I when I get through on the tour, I'm going to see if a possibility of going back. And they have a middle school there now that has a an email address. And one of our ladies at the chapel is German, and I asked her if I would write a letter to this school if she would translate it into German for me to send back to them. And she said she would be tickled. But I would just like to go. Uh, other than seeing going through Nordhausen again, I would like to to go back. This is a little town. It's just off the beaten beaten path, a couple of kilometers off the uh, their interstate system, because we're going to end up in Berlin, and Holly Germany and Leipzig Germany are like that. They're close together than in between of the road that goes to Berlin. And I would like to just go back if I could. I know that old German schoolmaster is not there. He is probably long gone. But just to go back and see. But that's other than, and maybe the time that we spent in Durham, Germany, because we were there as much longer than any place else. Yeah. But. I, I don't know that I had enjoyed the military service during that time or not, but 
I think we were trained. We did our job. <coughs> In fact, is before we went to Germany, up at Fort Carson, General Allen had them set up a supposedly a German bunker, and we had a live ammunition practice out there with a fire gun, military fire gun, ammo going overhead. You could hear the bullet snap, and gives you some idea of what to expect. And the infantry unit proceeded down, and we fired on the pillbox, and so those guys knew what they were facing. But I think we had good training. The training of the jobs that I did after I went back, I had good training. I don't know how many courses I went through at uh, Fort Belvoir. Uh, it seemed like every time. They turned around, they had an, a school of some type, maybe only a week or uh, a matter of hours or some <coughs> kind of a course that you went to that helped you do what, what you were doing. Mm -hmm. I through an, went to an instructor's training course. Uh, they had a charm school is what they called it. And you you'd go in and they'd uh, tell about things you should do or should not. He said, you never tell a class to take your seats, because if you, over there, you go into a class of those instructors, and you say, gentlemen, take your seats, they'd all pick up a chair and say, where do you want me to take it? <laughs> or you ask her a question, I would, you would say, Bill, can you tell me so-and-so? I can't, but Joe can. <laughs> but that, it's see, teach you how to ask questions, how to conduct a class. Yeah. And then, of course, that helped with, when I had the classes there at Fort Belvoir, I had to schedule the classes, schedule the instructors. And we had two classes a day. We had a day class and a night class. This was during Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot about power generation. <laughs> Well, uh, Chief Danner, I want to thank you for your time today. I'm well, I appreciate it. And, yeah. uh, we want to thank you for your service as well. well uh, and uh, if you would like, I think we can go right into the dining room and have lunch. All right. Well, let's let's talk about that.